let me start by asking a question. How many of you have heard the term oncofertility? So some of you have, and perhaps some of you haven't. And that probably makes sense because it's a word that I coined only about five or six years ago. And we created the term to really meet a urgent unmet need of young women in particular, who at the time were surviving cancer in increasing numbers, but were still being sterilized by their treatment. And so the word oncofertility, oncology together with fertility, was really meant to bring these two disciplines together in a uh, unique way. So they weren't looking to each other to say, well, that's really not my problem, that's your problem, but to really realize that they were both part of the solution for this particular need. And what I'm going to tell you tonight is kind of a little bit of a behind the scenes story, the bench to bedside transformation of that term, which five years ago was an intractable problem that today we have with us in this very room women who have survived their cancer and have protected their fertility as a consequence of the teams that have worked together in this particular area. Probably many of you are aware that the war on cancer began in earnest in the United States in about 1971 when Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Act into law. And we began as a scientific community developing a large armamentarium of new chemotherapies, of, of aggressive radiation treatment that would really uh, save the lives and increase the number of survivors with us today. But these same cancer treatments were having uh, uh, other effects outside of the cancer cell. So for example, we know hair cells can be lost as a consequence of these treatments. Uh, those are the things that you can see. But there are other things that are occurring as a consequence of the off-target effects of those chemotherapies, and that could include a devastating effect on the eggs or the sperm in females or in males. Probably the most well-known oncofertility patient is Lance Armstrong. Lance, of course, is the seven-time Tour de France winner, uh, but he was also diagnosed with a very uh, broadly metastatic cancer. But on that same day when he was facing that existential crisis of life and death, he was being told to actually bank his sperm so that he would one day have the opportunity to have a family. And he was able to do that, as were many other men, because the sperm is the smallest cell of the body. It's available on any uh, day from puberty until death. Uh, and it's available in large numbers. In fact, men make about 1,000 sperm with every heartbeat. And so there are a large number that can be protected even on that day of diagnosis until that day when that patient might need it down the line for their own fertility. So for men, the issue is really one of navigation, of that oncologist telling the patient that this was something that they needed to be concerned about. Women who had the same hope for survival and the same threat of infertility weren't being told about the options that they might have for fertility. Part of the reasons really is anatomical. The real uh, difference between the sperm and the egg is that you can see that the sperm, the smallest cell of the body, not pejorative, an actual scientific fact, you can see that spinning around in the, uh, in the media there, uh, next to the largest cell of the body, the oocyte. This contains all of the machinery necessary to make an entirely new organism. And you can see that it, uh, the majestic oocyte is available as a mature cell only one day during the month in uh, humans. And so that makes it a particularly difficult cell to access. And so this really created part of what was, in 2005, an entirely unmet need for young women. There was an information gap. They themselves didn't know that this cancer treatment not only was going to cause um, the loss, for example, of hair, but also of their fertility. There was really a data gap where the oncologists didn't know uh, what to tell their young patients. They didn't know if they would be sterilized by the treatment. And so this is really where our work came in and the work of the overall Oncofertility Consortium to try and ensure that patients knew that what their fertility risks might be, to help oncologists know what the threats were and what the options might be for each of their particular patients. In order to give you a little bit of an idea of the basic science that has driven part of this field, I want to take you very briefly through a little basic science about the ovary. What you're seeing here on the screen is my favorite ovary. 
This is an image of a rodent ovary uh, that's been dissected out. And what you can see are a series of ball-like structures on the surface of this tissue. Each one of those represents a follicle that contains a single egg for this particular animal. In humans, we're born with a million follicles at birth, and that's all the follicles we'll ever have. And dur over time, they begin the process of development so that uh, they can be ovulated at a particular time during life. And what you're seeing on the outer edge then are those large follicles that contain again a single egg that will be ovulated. In this uh, animal, they will ovulate about once every four days, and there'll be 12 of them that will be ovulated a single time. The smaller follicles that you see inside will be ready for the next cycle. And so this continues uh, throughout the entire reproductive life of this particular animal. If you cut right down through the middle of one of those little ball-like structures, what you'll see is the beautiful follicle structure. The uh, two uh, cell compartments within the structure that are important for uh, reproduction. The oocyte sitting in the middle of this fluid-filled sac is the germ cell for the female that will be half of the genetic, genetic code necessary to create an entirely new individual. And surrounding it are the somatic cells, those cells that make hormones that are necessary for the normal recurrence of the reproductive cycle in any uh, mammalian species. And so that represents one single follicle on its way towards maturation and then release of that oocyte from the inside of the body to the outside of the body. And if sperm are available, that can then interact and connect with the oocyte and you begin the developmental uh, cues that lead to an entirely new organism or the embryo is shown there. My research was really involved in understanding how individual follicles made decisions to move to the point where they could be recruited in a given cycle. How might in humans a single egg be recruited and matured when a woman is 19 and it's May and another sitting right next to it might not receive that signal for 10 or 20 or even 30 more years. How does that single egg uh, restrain itself so that there is a metering out of that million follicles from puberty all the way to uh, the time of menopause? These were really deep biological questions for which we really didn't have any answers. And because we didn't understand how to activate these follicles, this created one of the major gaps in our field because we couldn't activate follicles for a young cancer patient who might bank her ovary today against a later use similar to what we do for males. So this became one of the major uh, areas of our research to try to understand how to grow follicles completely in vitro. And so we began to do this like many laboratories do and take that beautiful structure of the ovary apart and put it out onto a piece of flat plastic, a, a petri dish. Well, we could actually get the follicles to, in fact, make uh, reform a little structure on that fat, flat piece of plastic, as you see here. The cells would, uh, the uh, hormone producing cells would make this beautiful fortress like structure around a central egg. And those hormone producing cells would produce the right amount of hormones at the right time during culture. But the problem was that egg sitting in the middle of that structure never matured and we weren't able to fertilize it faithfully so that we could get live birth from this particular structure. So we began to think deeply about this problem. How could we, in fact, get that egg to be matured uh, more readily? So we began to think about the follicle itself and wondered if, in fact, structure informed the function. So if we look back at the follicle with the very precise relationship and the connections between the nurse cells, those uh, hormone producing cells around the oocyte, we began to imagine that if we could maintain those essential connections and not allow the follicle cells to fall apart and reform on plastic, maybe we could get that oocyte to mature over time. So we decided to embark on a new area of research and we began a new collaboration with a biomaterial scientist, a good friend and colleague of mine, Lonnie Shea. And Lonnie is well known globally for his work on engineering uh, a whole variety of systems. And so Lonnie and I sat down and we really came from two entirely different disciplines. And we had to talk about what the particular issues were we were trying to engineer into this artificial ovary. So Lonnie decided that we would work with a material called alginate. It's used uh, routinely in medical devices. It's used in wound healing applications. And it's also used as a thickener in ice cream. 
And now what you're looking at is not the side of a Petri dish. What you're looking down on is the side of an alginate bead with a small immature follicle with a few of its nurse cells. It hasn't grown yet, so you don't see that blister-like compartment in the middle of that structure. And in fact, now what we've been able to do is to take these follicles and grow them completely in culture. And in fact, this follicle does all the things we would predict it should. It makes the right hormones at the right times. It moves the oocyte to the right position. And in fact, we can get the oocyte to ovulate. And what you're seeing here are two of my favorite mice. Uh, these were the first two that were born from oocytes matured from a follicle grown completely in vitro in an artificial ovary. And these two mice we named um, newborn and new age for Northwestern University. And so these are some of my favorite uh, offspring because what they really show us is that this technology has the ability to perform the function of the ovary where the follicle sits and that the follicles, once they're stimulated to begin to grow, have all that they need within them in order to mature that oocyte to the point where it can uh, contribute to an entirely healthy new offspring. So now you might be asking, well, does that translate to human? So in fact, with our young cancer patients who didn't have time to wait to go through hormonal therapy, some do have time to wait between the initial diagnosis of cancer and the first sterilizing treatment, for those cancer patients, they can in fact bank eggs or embryos, and those can be uh, banked for their later use. But for young, some young cancer patients who don't have that time or who are children or young adults, we actually remove a single ovary banking 80% of that tissue for their later use. It's in storage until reproductive technology keeps up with their fertility needs down the line. The other 20%, we ask those patients to contribute to the research lab that we hope will make that other 80% useful in the future. So with that 20% donated by the pioneers of this particular field, we've been able to adopt this artificial ovary to human. And so what you're seeing on this slide is a human follicle that's been grown in an alginate bead. And what you're seeing is a very beautiful oocyte that has all the structural features of a high quality oocyte sitting within the boundaries of the somatic cells, those hormone producing cells. And in fact, these follicles from human will grow and they'll grow up to about two millimeters in size. And they'll make all the hormones that are necessary to predict that this egg will be of high quality. And in fact, if we isolate the egg from one of these follicles, what we'll see is that again, all the structural features that we know that should be in place are in place. So what we hope is over time, we can continue to refine this technology and eventually there'll be a patient who will want to have their fertility restored. And when that time comes, we hope this technology will be ready for their uh, particular fertility needs. Well, it was really because of all of these breakthroughs at the bench that we were able to translate that into human need. And we in fact created the entire Oncofertility Consortium to make sure that science didn't work the way it usually works, which is that we have a breakthrough and we publish it in a journal and then you read it and you decide whether or not it is of value. We figured that if that's the way we were going to go, this would never get to patient use as quickly as it needed to. So we decided that we really needed to catalyze this work by disseminating it very broadly to the entire community. So not only are we working together as a team as the, at the basic sciences, but we're really working together in an unconventional way clinically. So oftentimes clinics take a long time to take on new technology. And this is partly because our clinical colleagues are so busy, it, it just takes a long time for that to go into clinical care. And so we created the National Physicians Cooperative as a way to say we have technology that we've built and we have uh, practice management plans and patient guidance information and we'll disseminate and give that to you free. And in this way, patients don't have to fly to Chicago and we think that begins to really change the way patients are, are, are treated and this makes for a better uh, patient experience. 
So not only are we working to try and work across the boundaries of clinical practice, but we also have a whole variety of societal issues that we have to address as we're building our teams. And so we have these bench research um, breakthroughs that are happening that are driving an emerging reproductive technology. But we know that there are legal issues that arise as one uh, is banking a tissue for a minor against a later use. We know there are social justice issues. We know that there are disparity issues. We know there are insurance and reimbursement issues. We know there are religious constraints. And so we began to think about all of these competing values of the individual versus the public, uh, public need and really tried to balance them out and in an a priori way think about how we could provide information to clinicians and patients so they could make decisions in the rapid way they needed to that was right for them and right for their family. So what I've done is taking you on a very rapid whirlwind tour of the last five or six years of oncofertility. We can't imagine, but five years ago, there really wasn't a medical management plan for young female cancer patients. There really weren't these basic science breakthroughs that gave us the hope that some of the, uh, these options might be av available for some of these young women. And what we really didn't know is that today, five years after we coined that term, instead of just images of test tubes and clinicians and legal issues, we would have among us cancer survivors who have not only survived their disease, but have also had their fertility protected as a consequence of this program. And really that kind of bench to bedside transformation is something that is so extraordinary. And it's been such a privilege to be a part of. And it's really very humbling to be here with you and among many of the people who have worked on this program. And again, many of the patients who are in the room with us tonight who really bear witness to this particular program and how important it's been on their lives. And with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for the opportunity to talk with you.